I'm Lisa Fletcher, and you're in the stream. Today, tackling gun violence. Have strict gun control policies in Australia made the country a safer place? And could similar laws work for other nations? As always, across the table from me is digital producer Malika Bilal. During the show, she'll be looking out for your live questions and comments, so tweet her using the hashtag AJStream. Malika, I'm seeing online that a lot of our community is noting fundamental and even geographic differences that they say play into whether gun control laws work or don't work. Right, and especially if they'd work in the United States. Yeah. Um, Christina on Twitter points out one key difference, she says, is that Australia doesn't have what she calls a gun culture. She says, I think Australia associates guns with violence and crime, i.e. there's a stigma, and in the U.S., gun ownership equals protection, strength, and freedom. Now, for those of you at home, whether you agree with Christina or not, we want you to let us know, so join the conversation by using the hashtag AJStream. And joining us in studio is Ambassador Kim Beasley. He is the Australian Ambassador to the United States. Now in 1996, when Australia enacted stronger gun laws, Ambassador Beasley was one of the most influential politicians as leader of the opposition party. And before that, he served as the country's Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Defense. Ambassador Beasley, welcome to the show. Very good to be with you. Good to have you. We're looking forward to hearing your perspective. You can also add your voice to the conversation by leaving a comment for us on our Facebook page. Just go to facebook.com slash AJStream and add your thoughts to the ongoing discussion thread. It's an easy way for you to be part of the stream. Tansi, my name is Erica and I'm a Cree student and I'm in the stream. It was Australia's worst mass shooting. In 1996, Martin Bryant, a 28-year-old mentally ill man, killed 35 people and wounded 21 at a popular tourist site in Port Arthur. Bryant was armed with two semi-automatic weapons. Twelve days after the horrific attack, then Prime Minister John Howard announced sweeping changes to the country's gun laws. Under Australia's National Firearms Agreement, the government banned semi-automatic weapons. They said all guns had to be licensed. And there was a mandatory buyback program that seized and destroyed nearly 700,000 weapons. As the United States and other nations deal with rampant gun violence, many say that the Australian model is worth examining. So, 17 years after the Port Arthur massacre, has strict gun control made Australia a safer place? And could similar laws help solve the gun violence crisis in other countries? Here to help us discuss these issues is John Weatherburn. He's the director of the New South Wales Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research. He's also author of the book Law and Order in Australia, Rhetoric and Reality. He's joining us via Skype from Sydney. And from Massachusetts, we have Mary Vrinotis. She is a research specialist at the Harvard School of Public Health, where she studied firearms policy both in Australia and in the United States. Mary and Don, welcome to you both. Thank you. Good to be with you. So, Ambassador Beasley, I want to get to the question we first pose. It's been 17 years since the mass shooting in Tasmania. Have the strict gun control laws made Australia safer? Yes, I think so. Uh, now, we don't have a gun culture in Australia as there is in the United States, nor has it been built into thinking about a system of rights as it has been in the United States. But having said that, um, and, and the, your other interlocutors here might, might have a slightly different view, but my impression is the amount of gun violence in Australia, which was lowish, has halved uh, since uh, that point of time. There are actually two events which are critical here. The, uh, the events that occurred at Port Arthur brought in a set of regulations which heavily influenced the uh, possession in Australia of automatic and semi-automatic weapons. Those are basically long guns, like the, gun, the guns that we used in Port Arthur. They went, gone, the lot, out. Uh, then there was another incident in which uh, a couple of people got killed at Monash University a few, about four or five years later, I think in about 2002. And that pushed handguns out of people's houses. So now if you possess a handgun in Australia, basically the only reason you can possess it is for sporting purposes. And that gun has to be left in the clubhouse uh, when, you go, uh, you, when you go back home. There are a lot of ancillary regulations uh, brought in place uh, in both periods, after both, uh, both sets of events, which govern the way you could hold weapons in your house governed the terms and conditions under which you could hold them and one of those terms and conditions was not a right of self-defence. You could not give the police 
a, uh, a justification for a weapon to be in, in your house based on your need for it for self-defense purposes. So it's basically hunting, sporting, uh, collecting with some very strong tests attached to both your fitness and how you actually use it. So what was it about the political climate in 1996 that allowed for these sweeping changes? I mean, this all happened in, in less than two weeks. There, there had been quite a lot of uh, multiple killings in Australia before that point. I can recollect in my time in politics a terrible massacre in Melbourne, the Hoddle Street Massacre, in which uh, well, more than a dozen people were killed. There have been quite a few incidents where four or more people had been killed and the state attorney generals had had in the early 90s a number of meetings in which they were trying to establish the idea of uniform gun control uh, legislation. So there's a lot of thinking about uh, as to what ought to be done. It is political but not as intensely political as it is here. Then this massacre uh, uh, at Port Arthur was so horrific, the violence was so monumental I, st I think, in fact, the numbers killed and wounded are bigger than certainly any of the recent events that have occurred here in the United States. The Prime Minister of the day, who was my opponent and political nemesis, uh, John Howard, said, that's it, finished. Uh, there will be no more argument on this. It's going to end now. And the opposition position was, well, yes, we've advocated that position for a while. Uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be in that. It was harder for Howard than it was with us, for us because Howard was in coalition with the National Party, which is a rural party mm -hmm. in Australia. And uh, if there's any view in Australia that uh, has any equivalence here in the United States, or uh, it would be in those, uh, in those areas. Well, it's interesting you mentioned John Howard because we've got a clip from him uh, from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. He's the former Prime Minister. This is him looking back at his push for greater gun control. I can remember discussing this issue with some of my staff and one or two of them said to me, you're not really thinking of banning all semi-automatics, are you? And I said, yes. I said, we might as well go for broke on this. I mean, if I'd backed off, I'd have looked hopeless and weak and people would have thought, well, you know, he's not fair dinkum. How many more people need to be murdered by a madman to convince the government to do something? Those sorts of things, if you don't deal with them decisively, they... They weaken people's faith in the institution of governments. Mary Vernietis, I want to go to you. Are there fundamental differences between Australia and, say, Brazil or Australia and the U.S. that would allow something like this, these types of laws, to happen there, but maybe not in other countries that see a lot of gun violence? I think there are a number of similarities and differences between, um, I'll start with Australia and, and the U.S. Um, there, there are some similarities that I would like to point out to begin with. One is that before the Port Arthur massacre, they had some pretty wide variance in state and territory laws. So guns that were prohibited in one state would be allowed in the other, and there'd be different restrictions around licensing and so on. And that's similar to how in the U.S. Um, state laws vary widely in terms of firearm regulation and what's accessible and how you can purchase it. Secondly, um, while it's been mentioned that there's um, some difference in gun culture between the two countries, um, or at least you see this happening in um, the media, this comparison, uh, they do have, or they, they did have a strong pro-gun lobby at the time that um, the massacre occurred. And they had been, this lobby had been blocking reforms in Australia for years, as has been happening here. And, um, and like here, most gun owners there were not opposed to tighter gun laws, but the gun lobby could count on a small number of perhaps overzealous individuals who were prepared to base their votes entirely on this issue and that's definitely something that we have here as well so it's encouraging to see that these reforms were able to um, to take place there when um, when they did face some of this so Don uh, Weatherburn in, in light of these reforms you've studied the crime statistics and this idea that the Australian gun laws that passed led to a say for Australia, you don't necessarily uh, agree with entirely. Explain. Well, basically the problem is that the gun homicide rate was coming down well before the gun buyback, well before the tighter firearm, or the uh, National Firearms Agreement. So the problem for statisticians has always been not whether or not there are fewer gun homicides now than there were before, but whether the decline in gun homicide accelerated after the gun buyback. 
Now, that's a much trickier question to answer than simply the question of whether or not there are fewer firearm deaths now than there were before the, uh, the gun buyback and the tougher gun laws. And what's happened is that various people have studied this and have come to different conclusions about it. Uh, one study in Melbourne, for example, uh, simply asked, I don't want to use too much technical terminology here, but where was there a sudden break in any part of the homicide, gun homicide series? And they did find some breaks, but none of them were anywhere near the Port Arthur massacre, or the, sorry, the gun buyback or the tighter gun laws. Another study uh, conducted by uh, a uh, well-known academic here looked at whether or not there was a relationship between the rate at which guns were bought back and the drop in the gun homicide rate and that seemed to suggest there was. Uh, trouble with that study is no one knew what was going on with the uh, level of gun ownership prior to the gun buyback and prior to the tougher gun laws so it wasn't clear whether that too was uh, uh, a solid demonstration of the effect of the gun laws. So the short story is that opinions differ, expert opinions differ on what's actually happened as a consequence. Practically the only point of agreement I think is that the gun buyback did seem to reduce the gun suicide rate, uh, although there was some surge in the non-gun suicide rate. Well Ambassador, speaking of differing opinions, there's the, our community members are weighing in here and they're asking one question uh, that I, I'd like to post to you. El Segundo on Twitter says, did the ban stop the criminals from getting them? And, and that's followed up on Facebook by Elizabeth who says, we have had a few machete attacks as of late. Australia has a high rate of assaults, mainly domestic uh, related, and she, she mentions the black market gun trade. So what has this done to guns on the black market? Oh, well, of course there is a black market gun trade in Australia, as, as you'd expect. It's a, uh, uh, th there is a criminal element that uh, wants access to weapons. Generally speaking, not to long guns and semi-automatics. Mm -hmm. Uh, they generally want access to handguns, so that's uh, because that's obviously a much more useful tool in a crime. I'd say this about Australia that that's, can be a bit different here, and that is the police are never outgunned. Uh, the police will always have weapon superiority uh, against any set of criminals. That's the first point I'd make. The second is, yes, criminals have guns, but criminals do not have an interest in giving guns to madmen. You know, criminals don't wander out onto the street and say, who here is truly, uh, uh, truly strange and violent and how can I give him or her a weapon? That's not what criminals do with guns, they use them for their own purposes. So it is a lot more difficult for somebody who is deranged and deluded to get access to a weapon well, in Australia. And as than an it island, you have a lot more control. I mean, uh, Saif Malik tweets in, he says, gun policy cannot be standardized. U.S. has a long border with Mexico, which is used for gun and drug smuggling. Australia does not. Yeah, there's similarities between Australia and the U.S. and very big differences, too. Yeah. And, and I, I don't like to wander around boasting as an Australian. We do have a very low level of gun violence. And it's a lower level than it was before these uh, incidents and before these laws were put in place. The laws in Australia before these laws were put in place were quite tight. Right. Quite tight. Particularly in some states. They weren't uniform, but they were, uh, they were quite tight. And uh, there was a... Uh, and there's, there's never been... Uh, there, obviously some individuals have had these views because there is immense influence globally of views that uh, emanate from the United States. Uh, one of, uh, I might say, the more hostile commentators on the United States and the American-Australian relationship said ruefully one day something I absolutely agree with, and that is young Australians absorb American culture like blotters. Mm. And so there's a, there's a real transmission of uh, belt of American culture, and that includes on attitudes towards weapons. So there'll be some people who have that view, but it has nothing like the ubiquitous character that it has here in the United States. Well, Mary, I'd like you to chime in here uh, on that, speaking on that, that culture and the view in America. Arhan uh, is one of our Twitter followers from across the pond, and he wants to know why would citizens of any country need any weapon at all to protect themselves? He says that's the job of the government. We also got a video comment from Chloe Angel, who is an Australian, and she explains why, and I'd like you to have a listen. While both Australia and America have a, a what I would call a grudging respect towards government, Americans have a fundamental mistrust of government, which Australians simply don't have. And when you combine that fundamental mistrust of government with a cultural love of firearms and a history of armed rebellion, what you're dealing with is a, is a very different animal from what John Howard's government was up against in 1996.
So Mary, based on what Chloe is saying, we're dealing with apples and oranges. How do you even go about making some kind of comparison? Well, um, first of all, I, I'm not an expert on Australia, so I can't speak to um, what Australia's culture is like or was like at the time of Port Arthur in uh, extensive detail. But what I can say is that it's absolutely true that there's a strong gun culture here, that there is a significant proportion of Americans who um, are very mistrustful of the government and who place a high priority on individual liberty. That said, um, there is pretty interesting evidence that has arisen from a poll out of Johns Hopkins and um, uh, other polls that have been asked since Newtown of gun owners and non-gun owners alike about different gun policies. And there is overwhelming support for a number of gun policies among Democrats and Republicans, among gun owners and non-gun owners. And there are even some policies that a majority of NRA members are willing to support, such as um, a universal background checks, making it um, difficult or, or not letting people with domestic violence convictions receive um, a right to have a gun within a 10-year period after that conviction. Um, over half of NRA members, 51% uh, according to this Hopkins poll that took place last month, would be supportive of um, banning high-capacity magazines that carry more than 10 rounds. And, right, and, and, and the majority of gun owners in the U.S. also support uh, background checks, which is that's something right, that's that the, the strong the, gun the lobby does not. The largest piece here of this puzzle is 89% yeah. of Americans total would support universal background checks, which means that all gun sales would be required to be subject to a background check right now. 40% of gun sales in the U.S. are not um, being subject to a background check. You know, Mary, um, I, I want to stop you there. You mentioned, you know, people in America having a voice in policy, and that's something that some Australians are uh, complaining about. Uh, some gun enthusiasts in Australia say they don't have enough of a voice in policy making. I want you to take a listen um, to this comment we received from Samara McFedrin. She's the chair of the International Coalition for Women in Shooting and Hunting in Australia. I would advise that the US avoid going down the path of silencing debate. In Australia, uh, open and honest discussion about the effectiveness and the cost effectiveness of our laws uh, has not been encouraged. There is a received view that politicians and former politicians and some sectors of the media and some academics have adopted and they continue to promote this view no matter what. And they continue to promote the view that our laws have been a great success despite the increasing number of studies showing that our legislative changes uh, have had little to no impact on firearms misuse. So, Ambassador, she's saying that most politicians are anti-gun. They've stifled the voice of Australians who are pro-gun and want to have open policy discussion and debate on this issue. Is there any way to really gauge Australian sentiment on this issue? Yeah, if you put it to a plebiscite, the current laws would get about 80, 85 percent support. That would be the, uh, that would be the result. And uh, there is very strong public support for, uh, for these propositions. Uh, it's quite true there's not a great deal of argument about it in Australia and there is a, a fairly strong unanimity of view in the political process about that. But it's not the imposition of some elite view on a broad mass of people who would uh, naturally have a different view. It's the first point I want to make. The second is this on relativities and it is a question you have to seriously ask. I dispute those who argue that the figures haven't changed since then. The, um, the, the gun involvement in murders has decreased from being about 30% of uh, uh, cases down to about half that number since these various laws have been uh, put in place. But irrespective of that, I think there are about 40 or 50 gun-related deaths in Australia a year. Multiply that by 15 for an American equivalent. So you take that up to about, what, 600 would be an American equivalent. There are about 15,000 gun-related deaths in the United States every year. I think that's probably an underestimate. So what's, what causes the difference between 600 on Australian statistics and 15,000 on Americans? Is it uh, a higher rate of family collapse? No, the divorce rate in Australia is higher. Is it a higher rate of domestic violence? No, 
the rate of domestic violence in Australia is at least what it is there. Is it availability of uh, violent videos, violent, uh, um, vi violent uh, materials? No. What is available in the United States is available in Australia. So what accounts for this? And now, I don't really have an answer to that, but it may have something to do with the fact that um, uh, much more than is the case in Australia. There has been at different points of time in American history an integration into the political po uh, process of the notion of gun ownership and rights in a way that has never occurred in Australia and there's also an integration into the process therefore that while it, it's not acceptable legally that is not regarded as unusual if a gun is introduced into a situation of dispute be it between Hatfields and McCoys or, uh, or any other more modern uh, comparison on the streets of LA that you might like to uh, entertain. There is no, nothing in Australia, nothing in Australia at the moment that is suggestive of the view that it is acceptable for a gun to be introduced into a situation. Don, I want you to jump in here. We've got less than a minute left, but, but your thoughts on the Ambassador's comments. Well, look, you can theorise all you like on this sort of thing, but at the end of the day, all that matters is what the evidence reveals. And the point which people persistently ignore is that the gun homicide rate was well and truly on its way down before the gun buyback and before the tougher gun laws. Uh, I'm not one who owns a gun or wants to own a gun or supports the gun lobby. Uh, I'm as concerned as anybody else about the level of gun ownership. But the, the simple issue is whether the gun buyback accelerated the downward trend in gun homicide. All right, Don, I'm going to the stop you there because we're about out of time. I want you to pick up on that thought, though, when we continue our conversation in our online post show. Uh, so if you're not already there, log on to stream.aljazeera.com. And before we check out completely, here's Malika with a few other stories we're following. Eritrean youth in the diaspora are protesting in support of a group of soldiers who recently challenged the rule of President Isaias Afwerki. On Wednesday, activists reportedly occupied Eritrea's embassy in Rome. They demanded a meeting with the ambassador, saying they deserved answers about the situation in their homeland. What well, follows a similar protest last week at the Eritrean Embassy in London, which we covered on the stream, and another protest in Washington, D.C., where netizens say this photo is from. Both the activists abroad and the dissident soldiers are calling for the release of political prisoners in Eritrea. Next up, what would you do if your government monitored your online messages? A new first aid kit, launched in part by the Swedish government, seeks to help human rights defenders secure their digital communications. The interactive website covers everything from encrypting sensitive emails to hiding online activity for those who are being monitored. The creators hope to combat online wiretapping and train activists in using the internet securely. And lastly, Google is on the lookout for young students with ideas that will change the world. On Wednesday, the 2013 Google Science Fair started accepting online submissions from teenagers aged 13 to 18. Well, we spoke to the bright young minds who won last year's competition on a recent show, including one girl from the U.S. who developed a new way to diagnose breast cancer. Well, for more of that interview, you can go to our website at stream.aljazeera.com. Lisa? One of my favorite shows of last year. I suggest you check it out if you haven't seen it. Now, for more on the gun policy debate in the United States, Inside Story Americas takes an in-depth look at guns, culture, and crime in a special three-part series that starts today. You can catch it here at 0030 GMT. Stay with us for the post show at stream.aljazeera.com. Now, tomorrow, you're going to have a chance to ask anything you want to astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. So, make sure you're thinking about your questions now, and until then, we'll see you online.
Welcome back. This is the Streams Online Post Show. We're talking about Australia and the effect of its 1996 National Firearms Agreement and the effect that it had on improving safety in the country. I want to get back to the conversation with Don Weatherburn. He's the director of the New South Wales Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research. Uh, Don, before we left the television portion of the program, you were talking about the influence of the gun buyback program in Australia. Yeah, well, I, I guess the problem we're having here is you know, the debate is that people simply say, is the gun homicide rate lower now than it was before the gun buyback or before the tougher gun laws? And the answer is yes, it is. It's about half what it was. But what gets left out of the debate is the fact that the gun homicide rate was falling and falling rapidly well before, long before the gun buyback and the tougher gun laws. So it's not sufficient to answer the question of whether it worked just by asking whether it's lower now than it was before. Uh, we really need to know whether or not the downward trend accelerated or whether or not it, uh, the, the gun homicide rate dropped faster in, in locations where more guns were handed back. Have there been any studies that can definitively answer the question of why the rate in the early 90s started falling? No one knows the reason for that. That's one of the big problems. Uh, the, the gun homicide rate started dropping and there's any number of explanations for it. One possibility is that emergency medical procedures improve. So just as many people were being shot, but fewer were dying as a consequence. No one's tested that theory. Another possibility is that the level of gun homicide was, or the level of gun ownership in Australia was dropping. Australia is a very urban society. People tend to own guns uh, more often if they're in the, in the countryside. There are smaller populations in the countryside, so maybe the level of gun ownership was dropping. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, the critical question is whether or not buying all those guns back and introducing those tougher gun laws reduce the homicide rate and the evidence is split down the middle about that. Well, in addition to that, and speaking of uh, the, the buyback, um, David O'Sully says guns can't be taken off the streets in the U.S. in a clean sweep like as what happened in Australia. And, and Don, you told our producers before the show that in Australia, criticizing the buyback is like criticizing the right to own a gun in the United States. Can you elaborate on that? Well, uh, it is, as Kim Beasley said earlier, the problem here is, uh, and Samara made this point here, that there's so much uh, consensus that the gun buyback was effective and the tougher gun laws were effective, uh, you tend to be uh, vilified if you offer a contrary view. Uh, some colleagues of mine, for example, uh, just statisticians going about their business came to the conclusion they couldn't find any evidence the gun buyback worked. And I asked them, uh, why aren't you doing some follow-up research on this area? And they said, because they couldn't stand the criticism. Now, maybe that's a bit soft skin, but really, uh, it's interesting to see the contrast between the U.S., where you're vilified uh, for suggesting there ought to be tighter gun controls in Australia. If you stick your head up above the trenches and suggest, well, the evidence is not clear cut, uh, there's an overwhelming rush of criticism uh, to that. But, you know, I think we should wear that as researchers. Uh, that's pretty likely to happen in any hot-button public issue. Mary, are there any countries that have adopted laws similar to Australia, and if so, have, have they worked? Um, the, the UK had a massacre um, in Scotland and also in 1996 where a number of school children in fact were killed and uh, for the two years subsequent to that they did phase in um, a ban on handgun ownership and the, the evidence from there does indicate um, that there was um, a corresponding decrease there for gun offenses um, in uh, the UK and uh, Scotland in fact has seen a decrease every year since the ban uh, since the ban in 1998 and um, if you look at the British Crime Survey which um, was unaffected by changes in official reporting statistics from the police official collections of crime data they measure a 27 percent decrease after implementation of the ban in, in gun deaths. So, Ambassador, it's been 17 years. Now you have historical perspective. Is there anything you would have done differently? No, look, there isn't anything I'd have done differently. But I, I do think, because this is so important here now, it's the Australian example has to be uh, analysed, and it's very helpful that you've got a, a number of genuine experts on this, uh, this program. Uh, uh, the gentleman who's from the... Uh, research in the Bureau of Crime Statistics uh, is, is by, any me by any stretch of the imagination a genuine expert. Mm. I, I think uh, you, you need to comprehend another thing about the Australian circumstance prior to Port Arthur Massacre. Our gun laws were pretty tight and, and if you think of the tradition of gun ownership in Australia it was you know the shotgun for the duck, uh, the duck shooting, a double barrel not a pump action shotgun. It was uh, the 22 uh, that you had to go out and, and, and pot cockatoos or uh, uh, birds. It was, 
uh, or it was the long guns on the on the farm, which tended to be uh, 22s or 303s, but they they're not semi-automatics. Semi-automatics was for pig shooting, or uh, or some place where you needed to cut loose with a lot of bullets. You didn't have people wandering around inside the cities with semi-automatics, not as a routine matter. And when you finally had one in the shape of Martin Bryant, uh, then there was a uh, uh, then there was a very vigorous reaction against that. So gun ownership in Australia had been uh, uh, revolved around um, bolt action, uh, non-automatic or semi-automatic uh, uh, weapons. So if you like, the, the possibility of widespread availability of semi-automatics was cauterised almost at, at the point when there might have been a change. I think, uh, though uh, I could stand corrected on this, most of the guns that were handed in uh, were guns which under the new regime would actually be legal, mm. legally in possession, provided you met certain conditions. So we didn't have a, a sort of cornucopia, if you like, of an extraordinary array of weapons in the hands of the uh, hands of the citizenry, and we never really had a culture that encouraged that. The laws were quite tight. Um, and the laws got very much tighter. Well, that word culture came up again, and of course our community is picking up on that. Douglas says, the U.S. was founded with the gun. How can you stop something that is ingrained in this country's DNA? But then there's another tweet from Melissa who says, is gun and general violence more important as symptomatic of social problems? Ambassador, of course, she, she mentions uh, something in, in referencing to the social inequality. What role does that play? Uh, you're going to have to go to somebody a bit different from me to get some, get some answers on that. Look, I, I, I notice more similarities between Australian and American culture and Australian and American society than mm -hmm. I do differences. Uh, there is growing inequality in the United States. There is growing inequality in Australia. That's, a, uh, that, that's an issue that, uh, uh, that both of us confront, in, in, and there are a multiplicity of, uh, uh, of reasons for that. Look, I, when... when Australia was created because of a uh, revolt in the United States. At least the Australia that we know was created because of a revolt in the United States. The British could no longer send uh, prisoners to prison hulks here right. in Georgia, and, uh, and so they sent them to Australia instead. So there's, there's that, that, uh, that immortal link uh, for, uh, for Australians and Americans. But when the Second Amendment was put in place, what was the situation of the US? The US faced existential threats. They faced existential threats from the British and, and frankly, from British allies in the Native American tribes. The United States had no resources for a standing army and had no resources for a large armory. There was only one way they could get, Americans could get sufficient force to be able to be certain that they could defend themselves. In those days, a good man with a musket could get off two shots a minute. And uh, when you looked at the people who were involved, basically all Americans had to be armed. And they, all Americans not only had to be armed, but they had to make themselves available for well-regulated militias. Either that or tax themselves to oblivion right. in order to have that provided by government. The Second Amendment was a National Defence Act. For the uh, for the United States, it was, and and then again, it was reaffirmed. You know, the right to yeah. self defense, right to self protection, well, was reaffirmed by the Supreme Court in two thousand eight. Mary, I know you want to yeah. jump in here. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what point I last was speaking, but um, I, I was just trying to illustrate that um, it really seems like there is um, high likelihood that there's a disconnect between the views being promulgated by the NRA leadership and the views that are held by the majority of gun owners and even by the majority of its members. Again, what you're hearing in the media is that there's, you know, this gun culture that just makes it absolutely impossible to even talk about regulation of firearms and, you know, the, the U.S. is so wildly different from, say, Australia, when I'm not saying that um, that the two are identical countries. But what I am trying to offer as an idea here is that, again, we have strong data from recent polls that were well done that indicate that a number of proposals, 27 out of 33 proposals, in fact, have a lot of support, not just by a majority of people in the U.S., but by a majority of gun owners, by a majority of NRA members. And so it may be that the voice that's missing in the whole conversation right now is actually the voice of NRA members as opposed to NRA leaders, and that's a really important distinction. All right. Uh, 
Ambassador Beasley, Mary Vignotis, and Don Weatherburn, thank you so much for joining us yeah. today. Uh, now on Thursday's program, you're going to have a chance to ask anything you want to astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. He, he's an astrophysicist with groupies. This guy's got nearly a million followers on Twitter. He's a lot of fun and he's absolutely brilliant. So uh, you're in for a big treat tomorrow. Be sure and tune in for the show. And until then, we'll see you online.